Tato. Thank you for the welcome. Catherine and I have worked together now for years, so um, thank you for your kind words. I've got to demonstrate that some of it's true, don't I? Yeah. So look, I, actually, I'm, I'm really excited about what's happening in Fort Square at the moment. Um, I'm involved in a lot of what you call large-scale restoration, landscape-scale restoration. I've been working in Taranaki and restored Taranaki. I've got a connection to reconnecting Northland. And more recently, I've become involved in trying to help with the Biodiversity Books by Initiative, the Cape to City um, conference that was here about a year ago, and all of those things. And I'm, I actually think the Books Bay. And I will say, because I've been starting up a little competition between region and, and New Zealand, I, I reckon the Books Bay is nosing to the front at the moment <laughs> on really getting stuff done on the landscape. It really, really is fantastic. And so um, today, what I'm hoping to do is provide the sort of the overview, uh, some of the backdrop to the principles of ecological restoration. And it will be coming more from the theoretical end. And you will notice in this workshop that it will sort of start theoretically and it will hopefully progress to connecting the theory with practice. Because theory on its own is pretty useless because actually the bottom line is what are we doing on the ground to make a difference? for biodiversity, particularly here in the Hawke's Bay. So I'll, I'll make a start and hopefully give you a little introduction. First of all, um, the People, Cities and Nature program, just to let you know where we're coming from. So we, we're funded by the government, we're funded by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment for our research program which is largely focused on bringing nature back into New Zealand cities. And of course, we're working in Nature City, uh, but we're also working around the country. And um, there are 20 major urban centres in New Zealand. We're focusing on about eight or nine of them. Uh, Napier is one of our focal, focal cities. But of course, biodiversity is way broader than cities. And again, I'm going to try and give a bit more background on where it all fits. This is our program structure, just for a matter of interest. You're going to hear a talk soon from Kerry, who's the leader of the plantings team. We're doing a lot of work on plantings, how you bring lizards back into urban centres, doing a lot of work on controlling pests in urban centres. We're making a connection to green space. You know, parks and reserves are not just about ecological restoration. It's about all of the important elements of urban design and the, and the importance of how how um, ecological restoration links in with other green spaces within a city. Uh, and then we've got some work going on on how you attract funders and how you work with business in cities to make sure some of these projects go, get, get funded and, and actually properly integrate with the business community within cities. This is called cross-sectoral alliances, is our little code here. And of course, Māori values, because we have many hapu and iwi groups working in the cities that where we're working who are running their own projects too and we need to make sure that that we're making the connection to the maru worldview and how that complements and links to some of us some of us ecologists and how we view the world we're looking to see how we can bridge that and build the partnership so that's sort of the structure of our program and we're very lucky that it's still got approximately two years to run and of course we'll be trying to uh, keep it going for longer than that too. Um, so look, New Zealand's biodiversity goes without saying is unique and fascinating and the big problem of course though is that a large component of our biodiversity is threatened with extinction. Currently 41% of our plants are on a downhill curve. 80% of the birds are in trouble. 88% um, of lizards and 100% of our frogs are really in serious trouble at the moment. We can't go into all of the reasons why today, but we will get some glimpses of that when we talk a little bit tomorrow about what's driving the decline in some of our plants. Just stepping back in time, um, New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand actually once was a biodiversity paradise and it can still be one. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm going to talk about extinction and decline, but the purpose of ecological restoration is to fix it, to bring it back. We go back in time, we, we were essentially a bird land 
people talk about New Zealand being a bird land because they were the organisms that dominated the ecosystem. Actually, that's not quite true. We were a bird and a bug land. It was our native birds and the invertebrates that drove the system largely. And that set us apart from other countries in the world because we did not have, apart from bats, native mammals in the system. And we particularly didn't have mammalian predators of the type that we have today, so the weasels, the soats, and the cats, and all of that. And the land was settled way more recently than most major land masses in the world, only about 800 years ago. And in that very brief time of human occupation, we've actually massively transformed our ecosystems and largely contributed to that decline in biodiversity. Here's the archetypal example. Um, when you go to the Canterbury Plains and you look around for indigenous biodiversity, where is it? There's hardly any of it left. Where we come from, in Kirikiri Roa, in the Waikato, in Hamilton, we're down to 1.6% of the original system. And I think the point about our work is that it's highly transferable to the Hawke's Bay because your Heratonga Plains and all those other places, and your Tuki Tuki Catchment and all of those other places, have that same issue of lack of habitat dominated by indigenous species. You all know what the main, I love that one on the bottom left, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Those are the pests, of course, that we're dealing with. And in the plant world, we're dealing with weeds, although some weeds we do need to view slightly differently. So, for example, the gorse one at the bottom left there, if you know how to manipulate and use gorse, you can actually use it as a very good tool to bring back native forest. But many of these others are <coughs> seriously problematic for us. Where we are in Hamilton, we spend a lot of time battling with Jap Japanese honeysuckle and um, woolly nightshade and all, all those other ones. And of course, coming back to extinction, when you look at the record for Aotearoa New Zealand, it is actually one of the worst records in the world. It's sort of surpassed somewhat by Hawaii. They're even worse off than we are. But you know, it's not a good record to be talking about, really, is it? 57 species of birds since uh, Europe, uh, European um, settlement. And the one that I love talking about, of course, is Pure Pure, which is on the way down to my homeland. I come from Taranaki, and I drive through Pure Pure all the time, and I'm reminded of that marvelous bird, European named North Island Thrush, which became extinct during European settlement time. 57 species, we've got no idea how many species of invertebrates we've lost. Significant numbers, we just can't even put a figure on it. This is a reconstructed insect taken out of material buried by the Topo eruption, uh, the Topo eruption about 1800 years ago, which devastated the whole of the central North Island, buried forests all over the landscape. And when you excavate the forests, you can pull out the bits of insect. And when you put the bits back together, you can find these giant weevils. These were weevils about four or five times the size of any existing weevil on mainland New Zealand. To see giant weevils, you've got to go to the offshore islands and see places where there are no mammalian predators. Well, giant weevils were all over Aotearoa New Zealand and they've been made extinct by rats and mice. And then, of course, you know, while Māori were on the landscape, they had a range of land use practices which preserved and protected the landscape. And they operated at a scale which meant that a lot of the losses were minim minimal compared to when Europeans arrived and significantly transformed the landscape. And the first European person who put their head to trying to fix the situation was a guy by the name of Richard Henry. He was the first man to take native birds like the kakapo and put them on offshore islands so they could escape the predation of the rats and the mice and the stoats. He was way ahead of his time. You know, he, he, somehow he put the story together. Most people didn't even know that the birds were declining First, by habitat reduction, and second, by the impacts of predators. He was the first person to put that together in his brain and say, right, we need to do something about it. And he took the birds. Secretary Island is one place that 
this happened. Unfortunately, what he didn't know is what was the range of swimming capability of some of these predators and the islands that he put the birds onto in short time were invaded by those mammalian predators and lost from the system. But then, of course, the New Zealand Wild, Wildlife Service started the first real, what we call, offshore island restoration. This was going on in the 1970s. And some of my um, relatives who live on the island of Rekordu, which is uh, the Chatham Islands, were involved in the Little Mungary um, revival of the um, Black Robin on the Chathams, the Chatham Island Black Robin which is a really intriguing story of cross-fostering, you know, taking one bird to another species, letting the other cuckoo, the cuckoo raise it, and then raising up the numbers, and then transferring them back to the island. So that was the sort of first style of restoration in New Zealand, where people transported things off the mainland and put them on offshore islands to give them a chance to recover. And then, of course, the Department of Conservation in 1995 started their program of mainland island restoration where they realized that it was okay if we tried to fix it on offshore islands but what are we going to do about the mainland of Aotearoa New Zealand and they set up a series of mainland islands the first one really was a place called Matra near King Country where the Kokako were brought back from almost local extinction by using uh, a range of baiting and trapping uh, methods to reduce the populations of rats, mice, possums, weasels, and stoats. Nowadays, sanctuaries are a major biodiversity business in New Zealand. As of 2014, there were 73 what we call sanctuaries. So your, your Cape Sanctuary, for example, and the Hawke's Bay is one of those. They're all scattered across the country. We've even got a sanctuary in a city at Zealandia in Wellington, you know, where the predator-proof fence has been constructed and we're controlling pests almost to the point of non-existence. Not quite, because recently they had the weasel invasion. They still really haven't quite got control of mice at Zealandia. And Monga Poetry, near where we live in the Kirikiri Rock, is another one. It's the largest one in the country because it's over 2,300 hectares. 73 of them now across the country. And most important of all, that figure at the end, I think, is that 42 of them are led by the local community. Yes, the government agency is involved, but this is sort of that trend towards local ownership, kaitiakitanga, stewardship, whatever you want to call it. It's a major trend in restoration. And, um, you know, I'm watching, as I said at the beginning of my talk, I'm watching what Hawke's Bay is doing at the moment for biodiversity, Hawke's Bay, Cape to City, the Guardians, all of that stuff is really starting to come together to take us to the new level, which is landscape scale restoration, including urban restoration, including cities on the equation, because we want to experience our own biodiversity in our own backyard. So we do have a fantastic network of reserves across New Zealand, and mostly they are administered by the Department of Conservation. About one third of New Zealand is under their administration. But the key point about those reserves is while they are precious, they are not representative and they do not cater for the survival of the full range of New Zealand biodiversity for a simple reason. Most development occurs in the coastal and the lowland zone and the bits that get left behind and this is exactly how conservation worked in New Zealand for a very long time. The hill country or the uplands where it was too difficult to develop agriculture. Even though there were some early settlers who recognised the importance of things like erosion control and water catchments, really the conservation estate that we've inherited is one where it was the bits that were left over, not the place the place, the coastal and the lowland zone, where the greatest richness and diversity of New Zealand biodiversity occurred. 
it occurred out here. There's some great biodiversity out here, but the full range requires that you have you have catered to the biodiversity of the coastal and lowland zone as well. And again, that's where we're coming in with our our interest in urban centres and our interest in fantastic programs like Cape the City, which are trying to address this problem. So um, we've been doing quite a lot of uh, work on this as part of our research programs, and we've been advocating now for some time for the notion that in all of the areas that are of depleted biodiversity in New Zealand, you really need about 10% at least of habitat remaining in order to prevent extinction in the coastal and lowland zone. And this is not an arbitrary figure, it's based on science. It's sort of semi-arbitrary semi because we haven't haven't entirely done all of the detailed work needed in New Zealand, or just starting to get into it. There's a recent paper published in the New Zealand Journal of Ecology, which talked about if you really are serious about bringing the birds back on the landscape, that the, the critical, the critical um, component of that is to make sure you have habitat more than 5 to 10 percent on your lands, landscape dominated by indigenous plants. And I will say that again, indigenous plants. Because our birds and all of the other fauna co-evolve with our native plants. And you can't take them out of the equation and expect the, the birds and the other fauna to fully survive. Yes, they can use exotic species from time to time. They can supplement their food reserves, the tui, or feed on the cherry or whatever. But for the longer term survival of all of our native fauna, there has to be a good amount of indigenous dominated habitat in the coastal and lowland zone. And that's the bit we've been focusing on. Here's the scientific proof from Europe. Uh, it's the decay curve for the number of species compared to the area of remaining habitat. And here's the 10% mark. And when you, you reduce below 10%, you lose species at a massive and exponential rate. You know, there's a huge, massive proportional loss of species from the system when the habitat area reduces below 10%. So moving on then to, as I said, this background is provided because we're not just going to stand by and watch decline, are we? We're not going to watch and stand by as it degrades. We're all interested in doing something about it. And of course, ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of ecosystems that have been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. And that also has within it that Restoration is a broad term which includes a whole different range of activities. The one that we're focusing on in our work, in our program, is the one at the bottom, ecological reconstruction. In other words, when you've taken it all away, you can't just restore what's left. You've actually got to start rebuilding and reconstructing the ecosystem. And that's the definition there, a restoration approach where the appropriate biota needed to be entirely or almost entirely reintroduced as they cannot regenerate or recolonize within feasible time frames. You've got to assist the process very directly. We know lots about how to re protect the existing resource. You know, we know about you know, how we can fix a patch of existing native forest by buffering it, expanding it, or reconnecting it, controlling the weeds, controlling the pests. But in places like Napier, this is the point we're making, Napier, Hamilton, Hastings, Christchurch, reconstruction is needed as well as restoration of existing resources. Reconstruction then is about moving beyond concepts of revegetation. You know, a lot of people go out and plant trees and shrubs, and that's great. You know, it's great because we have lost so many trees and shrubs in our lowland zone that putting them back is of great use. But revegetation, where we're just thinking about popping a few trees in here and there, 
is not the same as reconstruction of habitat. And so for that you need to know about what your targets are. You need to think about the full range of species and species occupancy that would have been on the landscape. And you need to build the habitat for all components of the ecosystem, not just birds. So, you know, in New Zealand it is great. The public identifies with birds and you can use them as the indicator of success. You can use them as the umbrella for doing all sorts of other stuff. But if you forget the other components of the ecosystem and are not systematic about trying to bring them back, they will not come back unassisted. And we're going to give you some examples of that too during the next two days. We've been doing quite a lot of reconstruction in Hamilton and so I just wanted to put these little images up to show you what we're up to in Hamilton. We have in Hamilton City what we call a natural heritage park where instead of the, you know, we've got the Hamilton Gardens and that caters for the camellias and the roses and lots of the tourists that come to Hamilton come to our Hamilton Gardens. But what has been missing from our parks and gardens network is what are we doing for our own native species? What are we doing for our native plants and our native animals? Because in Hamilton City, the total extent of resource dominated by indigenous species is less than 2% of the city area. Our city has adopted the 10% target in the district plan. And so we're systematically working towards trying to take it from the 2 back up to the 10. And we're doing it in this way in a number of places. So here's our natural heritage park. It was until quite recently grazing land. It's right next to the zoo in Hamilton, if you've been to, to Hamilton. And it has the lovely little peat lake in the middle there. And um, the local name for that, of course, is Horseshoe Lake because of the shape of it. Um, Waifakariki, though, is the more appropriate name for it. And uh, it's about 60 hectares. And in 2004, the city made a decision to do some reconstruction to bring native plants back into the city and eventually, of course, to bring the animals that go with, with them back at some date in the future. 2018, we've, we're up to 32 hectares of planting. The planting has been carefully designed. It's used concepts of target ecosystems and it's extremely well advanced. It's largely done by the community. It's done mostly on Arbor Day each year. Some years we uh, plant up to 28,000 plants in three hours. When we bring along something of the order of 1,500 to 1,800 people onto the site for Arbor Day, that's a huge planned military, almost military exercise. Our team here goes out for three days beforehand to lay the pl plants out to make sure they're in the right place so that when the school kids come in and their parents and everybody else, they make sure the plant goes in the right habitat and then uh, they get on with it and do it. And um, it's a remarkable thing to see. It's like swarming ants all over the landscape, you know, putting the plants in and getting on with it. So um, we've, we've made enormous progress. But, you know, we have got our eye on the long-term game. It's a long-term intergenerational project and it will only be uh, successful when we've recreated the plant communities that will then host all of the other things that we want in our backyard. And of course we have in mind too to put in a predator proof fence around our natural heritage park as well. Now I want to uh, move on a little bit into how you actually do the reconstruction. How, how do you put the ingredients back together? and some of the principles that apply. How am I going for time? Are you sure? uh, I'm You're 25 minutes to 10. I've got it. 25 minutes. Oh, yeah. Well, we're, we're getting there. Yes, we're well into the journey. We're, I need to leave time at the end. I know for questions. You might need to rein me in, Tony. <laughs> That's the way we operate on these workshops. I've got three people here keeping an eye on me and making sure I don't get out of control. So successional framework. This 
is the critical principle for how you put the plants back in the system. And it, it, it is based on the theory and the practice of restoration planting. And of course, um, I, I love to quote this guy here, A.D. Bradshaw, was the um, president of the British Ecological Society. And he made this challenge to people in 1983 in the presidential address to the British Ecological Society where he said the ultimate challenge for ecologists is to reconstruct ecosystems. What he meant by that was, if you can't reconstruct it, you clearly don't know how, to, how they work. He was, it was the big challenge that he threw out there. And anyway, successional framework is simply about the fact that anybody who observes nature after a major natural disturbance knows that plants recolonize naturally, but they do it in a particular way. So you always start out with what's called pioneer vegetation. So usually um, it's very robust, generalist species. The classic um, pioneer shrub in, in New Zealand would be karamu. Everybody uses karamu as a pioneer in their restoration plant. And through time, you start with a low-growing shrubland, and progressively it turns itself in the forest zone into a tall, complex, diverse forest. And of course the forest is, you know, it has multiple layers, it's diverse, whereas what we start with is often very simple. Again, going back to the Waipakariki example, here when you do the initial planting, it's, it's largely with pioneer species and you can see that holding the, the, the tikopa, the cabbage tree, or the Arapiki, the flax, these are classic pioneers that will get you started in the system. Um, Mid-succession, um, uh, things like manaka will, will hang around for quite a while and can be a nurse to other things, but you have to be very careful that you don't overdo it with manaka. Uh, Monodominant stands of manaka have a number of problems. They have disease problems, and more recently, you know, with the arrival of myrtle rust, we don't quite know yet what that's going to do to market. But one thing's for sure, when you have monodominant stands of things, they are more susceptible to problems. The other thing is, they actually tend to hold the site and prevent colonisation for other native species. They have a very compact, tight canopy, and they have a style of acidic litter which is also not too good for arrival, uh, arriving species and their colonization and establishment. So I'm, I always advocate for mixed, mixed planting with not too great a dominance of one species. Um, as we progress through the succession, what is happening in the system, and Curie will pick this up later in her talk, is that there are changes occurring in the environment. Shade and humidity are increasing, and temperature is, is becoming less variable and, and more buffered and, and um, has, a, has a, a narrower range. All of these environmental factors uh, then help in the process which leads to the establishment of fully developed forest. So you need to think about what are the plants we planted at the beginning, what are the ones we put in at an intermediate stage to enrich the system, and what are the really susceptible plants, the ones that can't cope with being fully exposed to light or uh, frost tender or whatever it is, they have to come in later if you're going to be successful with restoration of planting. So that was the first principle. And Curie will pick quite a lot of this up in relation to nature and the results of the work we've been doing here in Nature City. So the next one is reference ecosystems or target ecosystems is the term that some people use. You've got to know what you're aiming for. What's the goal in your restoration planting, your habitat reconstruction? And um, th this diagram sort of just indicates somewhat, you know, the point at which we are talking about restored local indigenous ecosystems having to be based on local 
indigenous re reference ecosystems. So this is as simple as touring around your own region and seeing examples of what it should be like. Who knows where this is? Yep. Um, often the small reserves that have been set aside, the little QE2 covenants or whatever, they can be used as uh, giving you an example of what it used to be like. That's your target or your reference ecosystem for habitat reconstruction. Third principle, right plant in the right place. And um, we're going to pick a lot of this up tomorrow, I know, um, when we're talking about both propagation and um, cultivation and looking after plants. All plants have particular environmental tolerances that suit them better than others. They have preferences and tolerances. And in the work that you do, particularly around streams and rivers, for example, with riparian planting, you've got to be very careful and know where is the place on the landscape that this plant is adapted to grow. So there is micro-topography. There are different soil and drainage conditions, and these all need to be taken into account when plants are planted. And, and this is the sort of thing that I mean, you know, that when you're looking at the site, you've got to think about what is the thing that's going to tolerate the fluctuating water table? What is the thing that doesn't like its roots permanently inundated? You need to know the tolerances and the preferences of all of the key species. Each, each community has its own composition which is connected to the environmental conditions of the site. These are just further examples of, of how people systematically think about this and plan before they start the planting program. I think these ones came from Auckland, these images, where they have some very nice brochures which show the different topographies, the different environmental conditions, and how different species connect to those. Here's the classic target ecosystem up my way, and I know it's relevant to many of your larger river valleys, you know, the Kahikatea forest. And again, although Kahikatea is possible to plant it really early in the, in the sequence, it is best if it is bought along with a range of pioneer species. It will do way better. And so we, we, this is definitely one of our target ecosystems. And it's a, here in an early, young, we call them a pole standard carpet here. You know, when you plant them all in one big group. And, and this is one that is not as problematic as dense monoculture of manuka, but it is also important when manuka, sorry, when carpet here for us to be re-established, that you think about the other trees that should be there. Because when you roam across the landscape and you see a kahikatea forest today, that kahikatea forest is not representative of the way they used to be. It's actually kahikatea is the one that survives the longest of all of the trees that should be in that system. And there are a range of other trees and shrubs that need to be with the kahikatea, often that are currently missing. You need to think about bringing them back too. Um, and of course, in it, uh, over our way, um, this is one that doesn't tolerate your, your landscape. Uh, they, these are the roots of another species that grow with Kakatira up our way. It's called Waiwaka, or Swamp Myri, and it's extremely intolerant of frost. These are its pneumatophores, or breathing roots, so it's, it's capable of growing in really seriously inundated sites. Which, um, <coughs> Flood, you know, up to three to four months of the year, and this is the way it survives. It's got its little breathing roots that stick above the water. And, you know, just like a mangrove, your metaphors rather similar. And of course, the kakatea here, well, it's fantastic, buttressing and tangled root system, perched off and perched above the level of inundation in the system. When you look at a riparian zone, in fact, what you're looking at is essentially a water table disk difference from often submerged to periodically submerged. And again, coming back to that principle of 
where do the different species fit in relation to those different environmental tolerances and preferences. These will all be on our website, won't they, all of these presentations. So you know if you if you need to look at them at some stage in the future, they will be up. We do a lot of work in gullies in Hamilton. And this is our example of our target or reference ecosystem for gullies. Again, see why it's focused into micro topography, hill slope, foot slope, back swamp, levee, stream, terrace, peatland. It's actually a generalized target ecosystem where we just put all of the ingredients that we know about for the whole of Hamilton onto one diagram. Mm -hmm. And it, it, this diagram is in a little booklet we call the Gully Restoration Guide. And this is up on the web too, this guide. And it really works for gullies, basically. It tells you all about the bits that need to go in and where they all belong in terms of a target or reference ecosystem. Right, we're getting to the bigger, broader picture now. I've sort of been focused in on the, the little local site. Now we're standing back a bit and thinking about the broader, broader catchment. Because actually, if you do restoration, even on your own property in the city like I do, your biggest problem is not the conditions on site. It's what is happening in your catchment. What are your neighbours doing upstream particularly? Particularly if they're doing things like discharging their stormwater directly into the river, and I'm going to get to that shortly. So you need to think more broadly, and in Hawke's Bay, of course, the Regional Council operates um, on a, a number of management zones, which are coloured up here, and of course they are literally linked into the catchments of each of the major rivers. And so if you're going to embark on restoration planting programs, you need to be thinking about where you fit in the wider landscape and how will you possibly or likely be impacted by actions occurring within the catchment. But also, if you all work together collaboratively and cooperatively within a catchment, you can actually change the conditions at almost a landscape scale. The catchment is like the unit before you achieve the next level of success, which is at the landscape scale. And the important thing that we've had to grapple with in our program is the major difference between the, the way catchments operate in the natural environment and the way they operate in the urban environment. And see this big figure here? 55% of water in terms of runoff. This is all about impervious surfaces in cities and how they impact on waterways and how they impact on, particularly on restoration. If you're trying to do restoration in the stream in a city and you've got 55% runoff problem, you know, what's going on in the stream if you're planting on the edge here? and all of that water is pouring into your system. We're going to see a graph about that. And there it is here. This is the pre-development, post-development um, time to reach the peak of flow in a stream in a city. And the general word for this is flashiness. You heard the term flashiness of the stream. If you're in my gully, because I, I personally do a restoration in my own backyard, and if I'm standing down near my gully and there's a major rainstorm, within 15 minutes it's like a flood wave comes through, which is this massive peak of runoff coming from the impervious surface in the city, coming into the stream and then rushing down the stream and flooding the stream margins. And so with my riparian planting, I have to be very careful to try and find the best time of the year to do the riparian planting because if I put it in, in the midwinter where you get common, <coughs> get these big uh, flashy impacts in the stream, the plants literally get ripped out by the water rushing past. Part of this is about how we retrofit and redesign cities to increase the area of pervious surface or what are fine ways of slowing down water by building uh, headwater 
um, wetlands which control and flow the water. But in many urban centres in New Zealand at the moment, this is still a major problem. So of course, um, when you're doing all of this, you're um, doing it for a range of reasons, not just for the plants themselves, but for shading the water <coughs> and enhancing the habitat for the native fish and the eels and you know the tuna, all of all of those things. And um, of course, at the same time, you're thinking about removing things like fish barriers, you know, pipes and culverts and things, anything that pre prevents the migration of the fish. Uh, this, you'll see that, um, I, love, I love this one, because um, we borrowed it from someone else. No, you don't, you don't have that problem, the fox. <laughs> but um, all of the principles on the diagram are important here, you know, about the setback from the stream, the control of weeds, um, having, having a system which um, provides appropriate habitat, not just for the the plants that you're trying to replant along the right period margin but for the, the fauna that lives in the water as well. So uh, progressively what we're trying to do in urban systems with some of this is, is try to move towards essentially what you would call a more sustainable urban water cycle because of the implications of that on habitat reconstruction. I think that's the last one, Tony. So you haven't had to hold up your sign, have you? I did it once. Oh, you did? <laughs> I didn't even see it. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's the intro, and um, I'm happy to answer questions. And if I can't uh, find the answer, I'm sure somebody else in the audience will. So um, any questions?